Okay. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Strategy Game Podcast. I'm your host, Lauren Shippey. Today, I'm here with Matt Shanlian, and I'm so excited to have him. Matt, thank you so much for being on. Uh, thanks for having me. And this is not your first rodeo. I know you've been on a lot of podcasts. I know that you do a lot of speaking all over the country. Will you tell us uh, where you are from and how you got to be doing what you're doing today and share with us what you do? Yeah. Um, well, that's a big question. And I, I want to apologize <laughs> first because this is being video recorded. A lot there. Everybody jokes that nothing behind me. It seems like I'm like a hostage <laughs> in some type of prison cell. It's just a blue wall. Um, so really, um, what I do for a living right now is, and what I've been doing since I graduated college is I really just take over my father's business. Um, mm -hmm. It started, he started a mortgage company in the late 90s, um, and it's got a pretty unique, um, just kind of ethos how we, how we gain business, and it's been unique from the beginning, and um, when I graduated college with my finance degree, I really actually didn't want to do this um, for a living, but I graduated in 2008 and that was not a great time to have a finance degree in the no, middle. No, it's not. <laughs> so what I did have was I, I could have bartended or moved home in my parents' basement and yep. been basically the lowest man on the totem pole in the company. And um, so my, I, I moved home and, and my dad basically, he paid me 500 bucks a week, said like, I'm not going to give you the company. I'm not going to give you a lot of responsibilities, I'll let you have it when you're ready. And, you know, from literally the copy boy, the, you know, back when there was fax machines that people yes. used four years ago, yes. fax is lunch guy, answer the phone to, you know, over time, you know, as a credit to my father, you know, it, it's tough to kind of relinquish systematically power from being the guy that runs everything to bringing me in on some items and then making me more like a 30, 70, and then 50, 50. And, and yeah. now we're at the pace where he's, he's our president with a, we're, we're co-presidents, I guess you'd call it. Um, but he's semi-retired and allowing me to kind of steer the ship that he has built over the last two decades. So um, that's, yeah. that's kind of how I came to be in the position that I am. Um, and I've, I feel really lucky that number one, it's a family owned and run business. Um, so there's a lot of great things in that. There's also some struggles, like sometimes you fight at work and then you have to go home and have dinner with them. Um, yeah, so, absolutely. Uh, right. I think we want our spouses to, to hear us kind of always talk in the business. Um, but it's really great because um, the wins, I think, are deeper. Uh, when we grow, when we get to hire people, we, we tend to hire people who are friends or family or people from our church and people that we can, you know, kind of maybe help into a different career. And, and they're being able to do that, not just as a career, but doing it alongside my father and also my sister, who's our operations manager. Awesome. Uh, it's really, it's really awesome. And so I hold that dear to my heart um, to be able to not only work in a family business, but we still go on vacation together. Mm -hmm. our, our, my sister's kids, our kids, you know, we're, we're just an extremely close family and we also have a business. And so mm -hmm. um, I, I feel very lucky that I kind of woke up on second base Um you know, and had a, a couple of things that I, you know, I had to work hard and all that stuff. And, you know, I, I do believe that, but yeah. I have a good kind of opportunity out the gates that a lot of people didn't get. Absolutely. What do you, what did you think you were going to do when you graduated or prior oh. to 2008? Because we know everything changed in 2008. So prior to that, you know, you know, I had with my father having a company in the mortgage industry and before that, even when in financial planning, I was always around it because he was around it and I was just always interested in stuff, uh, you know, math and numbers were, were uh, um, an interest of mine. My father is actually just a really great salesman. Mm. Um, so we're different in that way where he could, it, it, he would have been successful whether he was doing mortgages or vacuums or whatever. Right. Uh, um, he's just a great salesman. And, and so I always feel like I didn't inherit the sales gene where my dad is just like, you meet him, you've met him. Oh, He's yeah. a happy guy. And everybody's like, oh, that's Dave. Anyway, Dave not Dave. like salesy. I give, not yeah, I give anyway. business to Dave because he's great. You know, yeah. I like him. And for me, I'm a little bit more analytical and um, out. My dad, as my dad calls it, an overthinker. And so I thought, well, maybe I'm not built for like sales. Maybe I'm fine to planning. Maybe I would work. Um, more on the security side where there's a lot of research and data. Yes, the back kind of of, yeah. stuff. Mm -hmm. 
And then the last thing was, I thought, I, I, honestly, I really love sports. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought, well, you know, what? Well, that'd be great. Like, I, you know, my dream of dreams would be to like, be like a salary cap analyst or like a GM or a president of a professional sports team. Now I know that there's like a hundred people that get to do that out of 300 million. So like my odds of, and my uncle doesn't own a team. So my odds of actually getting that job were slim. And there was a period of time where I thought, you know, maybe I'll go like try to work for the Knicks in, yeah. in their ticket office and see if I can run my way up this, the, mm -hmm. but um, you know, honestly, I guess in the end I was a little bit chicken and, you know, the idea of, Hey, I've graduated and I was, at the time single. So it was like, I, I could go anywhere, but also yeah. I don't want to be all on my own. So yeah. I kind of, I fell back into this opportunity, I will say. Um, and it was the best decision I've ever made. I can truly yeah. say. That's pretty wild. And you know, it's interesting to hear you say that, um, that you are more analytical and, you know, your dad was more a natural born salesperson because from, just knowing you, the time I've known you, I would never have guessed that because I think you've managed to forge a lot of relationships and your space with the people that you interact with just in a genuine way that has led to really strong business for you. And so, you know, I would love to just hear about just what has the journey been like uh, in you establishing those key relationships. I know in large part with you know, financial advisors with realtors, right? Those are some really key networks for you, spaces that you operate in, but really in a genuine way and not in like a like cold called cheesy sales-ish way, right? I think there's like a lot of nuance here to clarify for business owners and for entrepreneurs in terms of like what they should look for when they are just really building relationships. What I will say is for me personally, the way that I am um, built, I guess would be the best way to say it. Um, I needed a coach. I needed help. Um, my father is, and still is, he's like, we'll figure it out as we go. Like he's a, let's start. Let's, I love let's, that. Yeah. let's buy the wood and start building and it'll be a barn. I don't know what it looks like, but it'll look like one when we finish. And I'm the, the complete opposite. And so okay. when I got okay. into the position, that I'm in and, you know, trying to grow the company or stabilize the company. Um, my father was just very like, he's just a great salesman. So he yeah. would do it kind of by grit and guile. And I wanted a more of a plan. And so I sought out a, a, a business coach mentor and I, you know, and um, um, I've been with her for uh, Lauren for another Lauren. Mm -hmm. uh, or about, I think, seven years now. And really, as I was able to get more and more influence in the company, um, but really, she allowed me to just kind of, you know, hey, I want to, you know, I want this to happen. And she helped me just chart out. And that's something I'm not great at is, okay. you know, if I want to get here, you know, if I want to get on this side of the island, and I'm on this side of the island, how do I get there? And a lot of it was just very simple stuff. Like, you know, I would see my dad in meetings and he would be, we, we speak nationwide and financial planning seminars, symposiums, all that stuff. And I would see him be in these meetings and people would, oh, Dave, you're great. Kind of a business card. And, you know, we would kind of just wait for people to call us in essence. My dad wasn't really big on the ask or, or have a system there. He would just be like, hey, if they want to use us, they'll use us. Yeah. Um, and me knowing myself, like at least maybe being, being hard on myself, not being the charismatic speaker as my father is like, I don't think I'm going to trump business up by just being mad. Yeah. And we grow as a company. We can't be Dave's mortgage company. We have to be PRMI and sure. not build on a personality, but be built on some systems, but maintain our culture. So yes. really for us, for me specifically, um, it was getting out of my own way and on my own head and just doing the work that it was very simple. It wasn't like Lauren mm. unlocked some like magic key she was she basically was just like when you go to meetings and somebody asks for their business your business card ask for theirs back and then when you come home call them yeah like it's it's just call them and be a be personal like for me our business is highly relational so we get our mortgages our leads we'll call them from financial advisors and so we are, have to be like a resource for them yeah. uh, education but also being able to complete loans for their clients efficiently 
Yeah. Uh, but when you work with somebody like that, you know, you can have, you can choose to be transactional or relational. Transactional is, hey, if you got a client, let me do it as soon as, you know, just talk to me when you, when you need something and I'll run with it. Relational is learning about their business, understanding their model because a financial planner that umbrella is, is quite large. Mm-hmm. There's insurance only, there's financial services, there's people with lots of licenses, um, people that work only with elder people or younger people. And so if I just was like, hey, I'm a good mortgage guy, call me when you have a new mortgage, that's not going to hit a lot of people. Right. But if I can take the next step to say, how does your business run? Who are you looking for? And then I can attach a need to what I think that they're missing. Um, I become valuable to them. And so they and so it's really about understanding what we're doing, but like taking our steps with our referral partners to be relational. Like mm-hmm. I've gone on vacations with financial advisors. I go to baseball games with financial advisors. I have been to weddings, yeah. the weddings. And there's all of these things um, that is really just about living. I've heard a great uh, phrase. You I grew up with like work, work-life balance. Mm-hmm. And I think really it's truly work-life integration. It's working with the people you like. Yeah, yeah. Um, and integrating your lives with them, going on vacations if you can with them. Yeah. You know, having them know you and your and your wife and your kids or yeah. whoever you have. Yeah. Then when something bad happens, you know, I make a mistake. Borrower makes a mistake. Something blows up unforeseen. We have all this back relationship that we can call upon to work together. But if it's transactional, it becomes like, I don't know if you've seen that meme with Spider-Man. There's like four Spider-Mans pointing at each other. Yeah. <laughs> well, like that's what it, that's what conflict resolution usually is, is like who has the potato last is the one that is gets all the blame. Yeah. So all of that advanced work you're doing, building a relationship, not only gets them excited to use you, but also when there's things that go wrong, you, you have like a team aspect to really um, – yeah. Push it along. Good. They know that you, they know that you genuinely care. And I think the thing that stands out about you all is the, uh, just I think people really are can sense your the character and nature, right, of people. And I think they'll pick up on that pretty quickly. And so just that long-standing um, proof of your character and nature um, mm-hmm. in the industry as an office as a team. I think speaks volumes. And so you really seek to see the people you work with, understand them, really know them, right? And you're adding those personal elements of just everyday relationships and doing life with them. Yep. And that then just translates to business and, and opportunities. So I think it's really just starting from that place of relationship and really knowing people and having that community. And that's what I've watched you guys build really, or have seen you observe that you've built. So I think that's really cool. Um, and I think it's, I think it's an, it's inspirational to, um, entrepreneurs and business owners who feel like there's a lot of opportunity within a particular industry yet to be developed. So do you have like any feedback or advice if they're saying, Hey, I have to get more involved in, you know, industry events, or I, how do I, how do I break into that opportunity? You know, does anything come to mind there? Yeah. I mean, I mean, for my industry specifically uh, and who I'm looking for. So in mortgage banking and lending, uh, most people are just working in their general local vicinity within about 30 square miles where their office is helping families buy and maybe refinance or once in a while. Yeah. Um, their business, we are national. So I work for th- advisors. I live in Ohio. I have advisor partners in um, Hawaii, Boston, awesome. uh, all over. Um, we were really lucky in doing that. But, you know, when I started at the business, a lot of it was from my father's friends and and their kind of co-advisors. And, and, and so part of the stuff I worked on with Lauren, my uh, sales coach, and I think that's the biggest thing is, as an entrepreneur, just to digress a bit, as an entrepreneur business owner, the biggest struggle I think is we just don't have anybody to talk to. True. And we don't want to, cause then we think like, well, we're a business owner. We should figure it out or no, like, it's- on us. And I don't have really community. I only have us, all I have is competitors. Mm-hmm. And I think the biggest thing with, that's a big misnomer, but also uh, going out and finding a coach, somebody to download this, like, you know, that's what Lauren's been really great with me is they'll say, 
you know, we'll write down our referral partner groups. Like, so we'll have like an association with hundreds of advisors or maybe thousands of advisors and we'll, we'll chart them and then I'll chart the business. And I'll say, well, you know what? This company's not doing well now that I'm charting it. I, my relationship is lagging. How do I, and then we'll be creative. Do they have a meeting coming up? Can I, can I talk to one of their account reps? Can I get a, a webinar going or a Zoom call? Yeah. So there's a lot of stuff that I'll do, but really understand, like figuring out what you really want to do. Who, like we talk about the story work stuff, like mm-hmm. who are the personas you're going after? Yeah. And really try to become an expert in who those people are and how they operate. I know that a financial advisor and a realtor have a lot of similar through lines, but they also have a, a lot that aren't. And I can't treat them the same. Yeah. And I can't market to them the same. Yeah. And, and so really dr- drilling down to who you are looking for, who you are trying to, like, attack's a bad word. But the markets you're trying to attack. Yeah. Um, and then putting a plan together. And the last step that everybody screws up is following through with the plan. I, I, I do that too. That is the truth. How many you plans? You put it all together. You spend the money. Completed. You got the Excel spreadsheets. You got all this stuff going. And then it's like, just pick up the phone and do it, dummy. And then some days you're like, oh, I don't know. I'm not good at this. Or I'm probably so going to bother this person. And yeah. I don't know. In the meeting, they gave me their card, but they kind of acted like they didn't want to give me their card. So yeah, and group discouragement, right? Yeah. And then, yeah. So really, it's just finding somebody that can help you build a model. Or if you can build yourself, that's great. I couldn't. Mm-hmm. And then build the model. Be realistic on how you're doing with the model at all times. And then just just doing it. Like I was, yeah. the last two weeks, I've been in Detroit and Louisville and San Diego at meetings. I have a stack of business cards that I got. I came home Sunday night Um uh, and this last couple of days, I've been calling everyone, emailing, putting them in my CRM, like all the stuff that I've been told to do. You're doing and it. Then, Good. You know, it's not an immediate thing. It seems like a ton of business work, busy work. Now, I have an assistant that puts the stuff in the system, but like the emails and phone calls. But that's the legwork that that has proven time and time again. And sometimes we just... We want to hope that people call us and um, intentionality in that is so big. So true. So true. That's really good. Okay. I want to shift gears a little bit here and talk about your culture, your team culture. I recently got to visit the office. It was really great to get to meet everybody in person. Um, So tell me about the things that you guys are really focused on as you build your team culture. So, um, um, we have three, um, what do we call them? Immutable law. There's a book I read through my, um, was called the pumpkin plan. Okay. And one of the, the great book. Um, and it talks about specifically these immutable laws. And so I think a lot of people have like, um, mission statements and all these things that mm-hmm. over time, like if you're a company of 10 people and then all of a sudden you're 40 people, like your mission changes. Yeah. And so if you want to keep revising your mission statement, then is what is it? It's really just an annual paragraph. Yeah. So like immutable laws are things that I don't want to ever change in my company. It doesn't matter if we have like 26 or 27 employees right now. I think it's 27. Okay. If I have a hundred employees, I don't want that to change. Um, and so um, it's um, undeniable integrity. Um, un, I should know these really well. Yeah. Um, um, I'm putting you on the spot. Okay. Yeah, it's a uh, it's the service. I can't think of the un. There are three: category. undeniable integrity, <laughs> unmatched service, and then unending joy. Are oh, three. I love that. And so, why I say the joy aspect is, I happen to be, um, you know, my faith is really important to me, and, and that's a biblical tenet of unending joy. And where I, why I want to infuse that into my business is twofold. Number one, I think that that tenant is so important to understand how lucky we are. I mean, we could be literally, we all were born in at least on second base because we were alive still and we're eating probably too much sometimes, but like there's a lot of people and there's just so much that is, is wrong with this world or or people that just get born in a bad situation. So we have that. Uh, The next thing is what we do for a living. I feel wholeheartedly like, I have a bachelor's degree. A lot of my employees don't have anything past high school degrees. I have a learned occupation, but my sales manager who 
has a high school degree and, you know, uh, went to the military, came back and is my sales manager, makes as much or more than any surgeon that you know. Wow. Um, and so the idea that we don't have, we have a job that allows us to make as much money as we can. Yeah. And we get to work with the people that we choose to work with and work as hard as we can. Like we should be joyful about that. Like you can work anywhere. If you don't like the mortgage industry, I tell my staff all the time. Yeah. This becomes old to you or just you don't like it. Just instead of being bitter, come and tell me, let's find you another job. Let me get the ref reference number out. Let's go find, like if you want to work in the medical field or go back to school, like just don't make this job be something that is, um, ex like makes your, your day worse. And, and so, and, and I told him like, but if I, if I'm the one who sees that you don't have joy, that's a worse problem. Cause then I have to have a conversation about your job instead of you telling me, I don't like what I'm doing. And so yeah. the joy piece is important. We want problem solvers, not whiners. We yeah. want people that, so, so it's very important for me to make sure, like, I feel like joy is such an all encompassing term because it's, it's our, it's on us to have it. So joy doesn't say joy when we're making a lot of money or yeah. joy when we're, we're, we're doing great business and we get to leave early. It's joy when like this morning I got an email as soon as I woke up, that was not good news about a specific file. And I it, honestly put me in a bad mood immediately. And then like my wife, of course, was just like, no, are you going to choose joy? And I was like, I hate you. Right. I, no, I'm not, no. And then you're like, I'll, like first. I'll choose joy. <laughs> Give me my little, like my little pity party. And so, but that's something we can always choose, even in good situation or bad situations. Like we're in it together, but um, this is a joyful thing. And if you don't have joy here, mm -hmm. get another job because we're going to, you're going to look weird because we're all going to have joy. So you're going to be found out very quickly. So those three tenets are, are very important to me. I mean, I think everybody wants to strive to have integrity and great service, but the joy aspect is like, we're not going to fight each other. We're going to fight together. And if you can't hold on to that, then we'll find you another place to work. It, no, no hard feelings. Like mm -hmm. find something that fulfills you. This fulfills me. I don't want to do anything else. Mm -hmm. I want to work with people that, that don't get all this, all their fulfillment from this job, but this yeah. job fills their, their uh, need for um, employment. I love that. I, I, it keeps coming to mind the term work-life integration, as you said, because I think that's really it's like what you're focused on creating, not only with the people that you serve with your clients, but also with your team. So just because it's not necessarily always about just the service that you provide, it's about the people and then doing life with those people alongside of it. And it seems like that's what can really bring the joy, you know? So that's just really awesome work-life integration and the pumpkin plan. I'm going to share that in the show notes because that's really good. And I think it's something that people can really attach to rather than a vision statement that's on a poster. On the wall. We all know those old school vision statements that are like plastered up on the wall. They look like they're 1995. Great. <laughs> yeah, no, and that's a hundred percent. And that, that, that book is really impactful to me. I love to read um, and that's very like self-aggrandizing to say, but I do love uh, to, to read specific things and, and I have other people always pitching me books, but that book, the, re the main thing, yeah, that's kind of a portion of it. The real main idea of the pumpkin plan, which is, I think is great is, you know, why well, I live in a rural country or rural uh, area where Jean lives and, and your friend and um, partner and you know, we, we have these, these county fairs and one of the things they do at county fairs is they like people grow vegetables and then they rate them. I think that's stupid, but that's a thing. Oh, okay. Um, you can grow a big cucumber and it's like, you got the blue ribbon cucumber. Oh, nice. So whatever, but <laughs> so there's pumpkins. You can grow these pumpkins that literally are the size of like a car. Oh, um, and they're thousands of pounds. Um, and it's a big thing. And the idea of the pumpkin plant is like to, the reason the way you grow that is because a pumpkin grows on a vine and generally the biggest pumpkins at the end of the vine and i'm not a scientist but i'm living i'm i'm living this illustration that he gave in the book you're close you're but close. the idea is that that vine will have offshoots of other smaller pumpkins 
from the ones that are this big to the ones that are jack-o'-lanterns to the big one at the end. Mm -hmm. And his thing is like a ruthless exploration because every time that there is an offshoot of a pumpkin, that's nutrients that's going away from the big pumpkin. And so his is like a ruthless exploration of all of the business avenues that you get that you get revenue from yeah. and what what is stealing away from your main pumpkin like what you know maybe it's not one but maybe it's two or three but you have all these little other outshoots you're doing that is stealing your attention your resources your time your staff away from your main revenue sources and so the pumpkin plan is just looking at what you do really downloading it and it actually has a lot of great um, stuff right. online and you write all the stuff down and you can see like, wow, I'm, gosh, I'm spending this much money for this much business here. And I'm spending no money getting all this business here. Yes. What if I move my resources to the real, like, maybe I like this. That's why I'm spending money and I, I'm okay with this. I, it's just a really great way to, you know, ruthlessly look at who you're doing business with and, and who is draining you and who is filling you and then cutting right. off those smaller pumpkins that's good. And the nutrients go to the big ones. So that's yeah. what I Well, that's really good. We talk about, we talk a lot about habits and how we spend our time and prioritization. And um, I think that goes right along with that. So if we're not constantly reevaluating that in our businesses, we can get off track. So it's important to have teams that do that too. So that's awesome that you've built it into your team culture and that you've done the work yourself. So that's really cool. I'm going to check it out. I actually haven't read that book. So another one to read slash listen to. Yeah. It's a great audio book. The guy's hilarious. He's from like New Jersey. Oh, so perfect. he's very sarcastic. So that's, that's how I took it. And then there's workbooks and stuff that he has on his website, but it's, yeah, it's a real fun read. Or, yeah, we'll, link it. we'll link it in the show notes. That's great. Um, okay, so as we wrap up here, Matt, any tangible takeaways that you would offer, a piece of advice, kind of your golden rule for business owners out there um, that are just continuing on the journey to grow? Yeah, I think um, a couple of, I love like nuggets, we'll call them. Mm -hmm. So like from different books or different speakers, and I'm a big, like, I love to like write stuff down so I can go back to a journal. And a couple of things this year that's really helped me is like, number one, there's a phrase that like, oh, what was it? Um, oh, it was like, oh, now nah, it escapes me when I want to quote it. The other one is, the other one I was thinking of is duty is beautiful. Um, right. And what I mean by that is sometimes it, as entrepreneurs, we, we live for the, the ride, the, 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 the new thing, the call, the conference call, the flight to this person for the deal. Uh, and we get frustrated with the duty of being a business owner, which is yeah. Yeah. staff and things of that nature and charting out. And we want to live on the excitement of the four or five big things we do a year and not the Monday through Friday and, you know, culture aspects, but checking in on your employees and how they're feeling and who they are and where they, who they want to be. And this idea that duty is beautiful, that's our duty as owners. It's not just to make as much money as we can for ourselves, which is important, yeah. but the staff that we have, making sure that they're happy because turnover is killer in a business. So if you're running your people ragged and you're constantly hiring, rehiring, training, they leave, boy, that's, that's, that burns a lot of fuel. And so yeah. The duty that is beautiful in that, the dude, the thing that duty is beautiful is that the day to day, the Monday through Friday stuff, like really tuck into that in seasons. There's seasons where you're running around. Like I said, the last two weeks, I haven't even slept in my bed, but one night. Yeah. When you're here, like really be here and not just be daydreaming about other things because there's just incremental improvements you can do. And then, um, sure. oh, contentment doesn't mean complacency. That was what it was. Mm -hmm. um, I think we always want to keep growing, um, you know, that old, you know, always be closing or yes. standing always and in all ways that people have all those key phrases. Um, there are seasons for great expansion. There's seasons for reflection. I think I, I struggle with that complacency feeling like, hmm. you know, when you're building a business or, you know, you go through seasons of struggle, you're like, oh my goodness, everything's on fire. You're running from here to here. You're solving problems. And then when those subside and maybe you're heading in the right direction, you're still kind of like 
PTSD is probably dramatic, but you still kind of have that feeling, oh, well, what else is going to go wrong? Yeah. We had two good weeks. So there's obviously a bad week happened and let me get myself ready. And so I would say like, if I would just be like, wow, like the idea of sitting back and be like, whoa, you know what? We've had a really good 18 months, which we have in our company. Yeah. We just, we've grown. I love the people we've hired. We've added offices, like financially we're stable. The idea of sitting back and going, gosh, that's, that's really great. I can be happy about that. Part of me, my immediate reaction a lot of times, I think a lot of entrepreneurs are is like, well, I'm not allowed to do that because either I'm jinxing myself or right. that time could be spent building more. Yeah. And so there's seasons that I think we need to make sure we have in our lives where it's like, yeah, you know what? I tell my wife, I call it sprinting. I was like, sometimes I got to go on a sprint yeah. and I got to run around a little bit. There's things that stack up. It's fine. But I made a big decision this year that I'm not traveling in the summer. My kids are in school. So when they're not in school, I'm not traveling. Yeah. And that season was really content because I was hanging around. We went on vacations together and yeah. played in the backyard and all this kind of stuff. And some of the dad stuff that I don't get to do as an entrepreneur, I can do that in those periods. That was a season of contentment. And then when school hit three, four weeks ago, yeah, back in that other season of like, let's build, let's grow, let's let's do things, but be okay. And that's my personal struggle is being okay with like foot off the gas for a little bit yes, and taking stock and then refueling. And then, because I've done it before where I just put, kept my foot on the gas for a, a year, about three years ago. And I got to Thanksgiving. My wife's like, you are like almost worthless to the rest of us. Like you're completely empty when you get home. Yep. I don't know what you're doing. Like this has got to change. And so, yeah, it's just Good. those two phrases, man. Do um, I said, man? I'm sorry, but duty yeah. is beautiful. <laughs> duty and, is beautiful. And yeah, the contentment isn't complacent. complacent. Doesn't mean complacency. Yep, really, really good, Matt. Thank you so much. So much wisdom in this episode. I can't wait to share it. I'm thankful that we get to work with you at the yeah. Marketing Engine. I love uh, just being a part of your team. So thanks so much for coming on. Yeah, I appreciate you guys so much. And anytime uh, you, you need me, you got me. Yeah, love it. Thank you.